Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Leonard, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak on should younger patients with mantle cell lymphoma receive upfront autologous stem cell transplant? And here's my emphatic yes. These are my disclosures. So for the purposes of this talk, younger will be defined as age less than or equal to 65, and this is just because this is the inclusion for the trial, not because it's what I think of as young. Um, we know that the median overall survival in mantle cell lymphoma in the early 2000s was about three to five years. We know that this has improved with our current therapies, and studies would suggest that maybe doubled in this population of younger patients. This is with the incorporation of rituximab, high-dose cytarabine induction regimens, consolidation with autologous stem cell transplant, and then the availability of therapies such as the BTK inhibitors ibrutinib and acalabrutinib at relapse. However, unlike follicular lymphoma or CLL where progress has been made, we know that young patients with mantle cell lymphoma are still most likely to die of their mantle cell lymphoma. There has only been one randomized trial looking at the benefit of consolidation transplant in this population of patients. And as you can see, this was prior to the approval of rituximab. So while there was both a progression-free survival benefit and an overall survival benefit in this trial to consolidating patients with autologous transplant, it's not clear that this really translates to the therapies that we use today. Probably the two most utilized regimens are the Nordic regimen and the RCHOP RDHAP regimen. So the Nordic regimen looks at alternating R maxi CHOP with R RSC and then consolidating patients with transplant. Then this was really the first regimen to show the benefit of cytarabine in induction therapy, followed by consolidation with transplant. At a long-term follow-up, um, they treated 160 patients with a median age 56, and at a median follow-up of 11.4 years, the median progression-free survival was eight and a half years, with overall survival of 12.7. Unfortunately, this also did show, if you look here at the progression-free survival curve, that while there were patients making it out to 10 years, this curve does not flatten off, meaning that we're not curing these patients and there is a continuous pattern of relapse. The European Mantle Cell Lymphoma Group then further established the role of the cytarabine in induction by randomizing patients to receive six cycles of RCHOP versus RCHOP alternating with RDHAP, followed by stem cell transplant. In this, they looked at five, nearly 500 patients with a median age of 55, and at a median follow-up of 6.1 years, they showed a benefit in both time-to-treatment failure and progression-free survival in those patients who received the cytarabine induction. So far, there is not the median overall survival was 12.7 years, but there was not a um, difference in these patients. So let's just take a minute and think about this. So the median progression-free survival of these cytarabine-based inductions followed by transplant is eight to nine years. What about in non-transplant regimens? So RCHOP, VRCAP, BR. What we're getting out of those is a median progression-free survival of somewhere between two to four and a half years. Now, what you can see is that I made a little asterisk here, and that's because recently updated data of treating a cohort of patients up front with r lenalidomide at five years actually showed pretty impressive curves that are comparable to those that we see with um, aggressive induction regimens. However, this was in a smaller cohort of patients, about a little 30-some <clears throat> patients, and so more patients are needed to really um, make statements about that. The other regimen that's used is r hyper -CVAD, alternating with methotrexate and cytarabine. While this is showing similar progression-free survival, including with long-term follow-up, outside of the initial study of this, other places have found it hard to um, give this regimen due to tolerability in patients. Further, the long-term follow-up of this at 15 years showed that there was a 6.2% risk of secondary myeloid malignancies for patients in first CR, which was actually double that of the um, induction and transplant regimens at any time point. So that included patients who had even been treated with other salvage therapies. So questioning again the tolerability of this regimen. So cytarabine induction followed by autologous stem cell transplant. <clears throat> doing well but not curing patients. Can we do even better than that? The LIMA trial was a trial that looked at using a cisplatin and cytarabine-based induction regimen followed by autologous stem cell transplant and then randomized patients to either observation or rituximab maintenance. We know that in older patients treated with RCHOP that rituximab maintenance provides both a progression-free survival and overall survival benefit. <clears throat> 
And in this study, they did show that patients um, at a median age of 56 and a median follow-up of 52 months had a benefit in both progression-free survival and overall survival when they received maintenance therapy with rituximab after transplant. Recently reported um, data from the Nordic Lymphoma Group has also shown that in their cohort of patients that received rituximab maintenance after transplant, that there was a benefit to progression-free survival, although thus far not a benefit to overall survival with the rituximab maintenance. Are there patients that shouldn't be transplanted? So we know that there are patients with mantle cell lymphoma who have worse outcomes overall, pretty much with all standard therapies that we give. These include patients that are high risk by the MIPI, which is a mantle cell prognostic score, and blasted variant patients. If you look, it's been shown that in these transplant studies, the benefit seems to be most in these patients with low risk MIPI and even intermediate risk MIPI, where patients with high risk MIPI do worse overall. However, there was a recent study uh, um, conducted at, retrospective study conducted at 25 centers that looked at outcomes in the rituximab era of patients 65 and younger who were treated um, and it was just per whatever the center. So some received transplant and some didn't receive transplant. They showed that in the patients that received transplant, there was a progression-free survival benefit, not an overall survival benefit. However, when they looked at certain risk patients, they saw that both in patients with MIPI high risk and blastoid variant mantle cell, that there was an overall survival benefit to those patients who received consolidation with transplant versus those patients who didn't. So while these high-risk patients don't do as well as the low-risk with transplant, it appears that they potentially do better than they do with non-intensive regimens. Um, medical residual disease, does everybody need a transplant? So it's been shown that patients, the ability to achieve minimal residual disease, um, both prior to transplant and after transplant, leads to better um, improval in both progression-free survival and overall survival. This has even been shown in the less intensive regimens without transplant, that if you can induce a minimal residual disease state, people do better. This is probably where you're seeing the benefit of the cytarabine induction. You're getting more patients into an MRD remission. With transplant, you're converting even more patients to MRD negative remission. And with rituximab maintenance, it's been shown that you have the ability to eliminate MRD positive um, disease. So relapse refractory disease, why do I bring up relapse refractory disease? Because probably the best therapy we have at relapse is the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. This just shows that um, ibrutinib is best used when patients are first relapse as opposed to when they've had many prior. But even at first relapse, the median progression-free survival is only 25.4 months. So if you take that 55 to 56-year-old patient and you give them cytarabine induction, transplant them, and then they relapse in eight to nine years, and then you give them ibrutinib and they get two years out of that, you now have a 66, 67 year old who's really blown through their best therapies. Um, and you know, while there's other options, they're going to last less time and they're not gonna have as good of responses. You now take that patient and give them an induction regimen that only gives them a PFS of four to five years, and you now have somebody in their early 60s who is likely to die in the next few years of their disease. And last but not least, so there's always a caveat. So there is one group of patients that I'm not even gonna argue for transplant, and those are patients with TP53 mutation. It's been shown that these patients have very poor outcomes um, despite giving them aggressive therapy with a median overall survival of less than two years. So, in conclusion, my final arguments are that I would argue that a cytarabine-based induction regimen followed by autologous stem cell transplant followed by rituximab maintenance should be the standard in these patients. While there are clinical and biological features that define high-risk disease, it's unclear that we have other therapies better than these intensive inductions that um, provide better outcomes, and it's also clear that while they, they don't do as well as patients with low-risk disease features, that they still probably do better than not giving them more intensive therapy. We need to increase our ability to achieve MRD negative status with our induction regimens um, because these patients do the best and maybe they don't need the transplant. We need to find ways to eliminate that MRD positive with different maintenance strategies. While I would argue that all patients with mantle cell lymphoma should um, go on a clinical trial, I would say that patients with TP53 P53 mutated disease should 100% all be placed on clinical trials. And that younger patients 
are likely to die from their disease and intensive frontline approaches do appear to improve their outcomes. And lastly, I'll end with two ongoing studies that will really help to answer this question. So the ECOG study, um, this is a randomized phase three trial that takes all patients who are um, not in CR or have MRD detectable disease and transplants them. And it takes the patients who have an MRD negative disease and randomizes them to autolog autologous transplant plus rituximab maintenance versus rituximab maintenance alone, trying to answer the question, do these patients really need to be transplanted when they achieve a deep remission with induction? And lastly, the triangle study, which is a randomized three-arm study um, being conducted in Europe, which randomizes people to what is their standard RCHOP, RDHAP, followed by transplant. And then the other two arms are to look at the benefit of ibrutinib in the frontline therapy and the benefit of autologous stem cell transplant when you incorporate novel therapy. So they get either RCHOP, RDHAP, plus ibrutinib, followed by autotransplant, followed by ibrutinib maintenance, or RCHOP, RDHAP, followed by, with ibrutinib, followed by just ibrutinib maintenance without transplant.